this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to answer the question, does the Fed never actually print money? This video is going to be a response to a very popular video that a lot of people have sent me. That's with Brent Johnson and Stephen Van Meter, in which they argue that quantitative easing or central bank money printing actually removes liquidity from the system and causes deflation. This has caused quite a stir in the community. So I just wanted to address some of it because it does contradict a lot of the stuff that I've been teaching. If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works so that you can make money in both bull and bear markets, or you just want to see what I'm trading and investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So if you want to watch this video, you can start at about the minute 11 or 12 to hear their argument, but I'm going to summarize it for you very briefly here. They basically are saying that the Fed never actually prints money. When it buys government bonds, when it does quantitative easing, it's basically just handing out uh, bank reserves, which the bank then needs to keep locked up at the Fed. And the only way this money would ever make its way into the economy, according to their argument, is if the banks started making loans against it. But the banks are not lending much now. We're in a deflationary scenario. And so the money supply cannot increase simply because the banks are not able to lend out this money that it gets from the Fed, this money that they get from the Fed. Therefore, quantitative easing is deflationary. So this is the basic argument that they're making. If we do take a look at commercial industrial loans, for example, we can see what he is talking about in terms of, at least on the uh, the commercial lending side of things, obviously the mortgage market is, uh, mortgage lending, lending for houses is doing quite well. Um, but here we can see that there is this contraction in commercial lending. But what I would ask uh, Van Meter is, has he ever looked at a chart of the M2 money supply. Here's the M2 money supply. So in spite of the fact that the banks aren't lending as much as they were before the COVID crisis, the money supply looks like a momentum stock. It's uh, hitting new highs here. And we can see right here, this, sh this shaded area is sort of the beginning of uh, the current recession in February. And it's really gone vertical. It began the year uh, roughly around, uh, call it uh, 15 trillion. And it's now in the uh, 18, almost 19 trillion. So the money supply is still increasing. We can take a look at gold. Gold has gone up a lot. Uh, gold has gone up a tremendous amount this year, as has Bitcoin. So I would ask Van Meter if, uh, if quantitative easing is deflationary and shrinks the money supply because of a lack of commercial lending, how does he explain the chart of M2? Also, does Van Meter ever notice that whenever the Fed announces more quantitative easing, that stocks go up a lot. And I would ask Van Meter, do stocks go up a lot in a deflationary environment? Obviously, they don't. The last time we had real deflation was during the Great Depression. Stocks were very weak. When you have an inflationary economy or an economy where the currency is being debased, like in Zimbabwe or Venezuela, you actually get a very strong stock market. It doesn't go up in real terms, but it does go up in nominal terms. And so I think this contradicts with what uh, Van Meter and Brett Johnson are talking about, simply because whenever, actually whenever quantitative easing is announced in any part of the world, for example, in 2000, I think it was late 2008 or 2009, when China announced they were going to do a lot of quantitative easing, it made stocks go up in the U.S. And so equity prices seem to go up whenever more QE is announced. And then they stay up as long as the QE keeps going going. And so I would suggest that this, this tells you in itself that it's absurd to say, to think that quantitative easing drains liquidity from the system. When you drain liquidity from the system, you get gold crashing, you get Bitcoin crashing, you get stocks crashing and real estate crashing. And then the very obvious answer, um, the other obvious question I would ask him is, does Van Meter, does he shop for groceries? Does he live in a house? Does he have health insurance? Does he pay medical bills? Is he seeing deflation? in all these categories. So where I would like to know exactly where's all this deflation that he's talking about. We're certainly not seeing deflation in equity prices. Maybe we're seeing some deflation in commercial uh, real estate prices and certain pockets of the economy. There's obviously deflationary forces at work for the airlines, for people who work in travel, uh, this, this sort of thing. Uh, but the general economy, I don't see the deflation. I've talked a lot about the CPI number and how fake it is, consumer and price index. You can check out my other videos on that. But the longer you listen to Van Meter, you realize that he really has an axe to grind 
and along with Brett Johnson is that they're very they're very bullish on the Dixie on the DXY and uh, they think that stocks are going to crash the US dollar is going to strengthen and wipe everything out now I don't have a strong view on the DXY on the Dixie it's basically an index of sinking ships the US dollar the US dollar is shrinking is sinking the euro is sinking the yen is sinking these are all fiat currencies that are being debased and so it's a race to see who can sink their ship faster so perhaps uh, maybe the, the US dollar does strengthen because the US is, is sinking less quickly than the euro but even then it would seem that whenever the US dollar uh, strengthens a lot against other currencies and against real assets like gold and Bitcoin and stocks that the Fed steps in immediately with the printing press and starts and starts printing so I think that um, their basic thesis if you're going to listen to these guys and be short stocks and bet on the US dollar strengthening against everything uh, I just don't think that's going to happen simply because the Fed has this technology as Ben Bernanke used to used to love saying called a printing press it's obviously a digital printing press now they can create money at the click of a button so you can look at the US money supply it's still rising this is obviously not a deflationary chart gold is not showing deflation when what does happen is when the, the Fed stops quantitative easing or when they slow it down you get a pullback in gold in Bitcoin in equities that's what we've seen really since the beginning of August and uh, this is this is um, one reason that you know you can see for example quantitative easing really revved up here and then it slows down it levels off uh, here and uh, we can see exactly that the more quantitative easing the more stocks and gold go up here's a chart of the Fed's balance sheet and we can see that real spike that's happened where it's driven the balance sheet really from around four trillion to over seven trillion uh, this is this is how you can see quantitative easing this is when the Fed buys assets with newly printed money this is a snapshot of what is on the Fed's balance sheet it's mostly treasuries it's mortgage-backed securities it's junk bonds etc so I would say that the US money supply chart gold stocks they do not show deflation now let's let's briefly review what happens in quantitative easing and just see where his argument takes us so basically the US Treasury auctions off government bonds which are called treasuries at these bond auctions these government uh, bond auctions and they're these things called the primary dealers which are just big uh, big scummy banks like Goldman Sachs and they basically buy these bonds and then they can distribute them they can distribute them to their clients or they can also sell them to the Fed and when this happens at these bond auctions the US uh, Treasury would give Goldman Sachs a bond that they've won at the auction and then Goldman Sachs would give the US Treasury cash obviously these are all digital entries they're not bags or briefcases of cash being exchanged but it is cash it does settle as cash and this is an actual bond auction I don't think Van Meter would ever argue that Goldman Sachs does not actually pay cash for the bonds that it buys at these bond auctions that would be um, a bit of a uh, a bit of a uh, Potemkin village or sort of a joke if that were true but Goldman Sachs does pay for the bonds they pay for them at the auction and the reason the US Treasury does these auctions is to raise cash and then Congress can pass bills and the president can sign them and Congress can spend money out of the Treasury account now Congress needs that cash why do we even have government bonds well simply because as we know the US government spends a lot more money than it brings in in taxes and so that's why the US Treasury has to offer uh, auction off these bonds so Goldman Sachs then takes these bonds and as we'll see the vast majority of them it sells them to the Federal Reserve which is a central bank in the US and what does the Federal Reserve do it prints up some new dollars gives it to Goldman Sachs in exchange for the bonds now this is where Van Meter and Brett Johnson they like to dig in very deeply here and say well the Fed is not actually giving them cash the Fed is just crediting the Goldman Sachs reserve account at the Fed now that's fine that is that is uh, I have to take everyone's word that that's how it works obviously I've never been inside of the Fed but this is this is how it works the small banks have accounts at the big daddy bank which is the Fed so the central bank is the bankers bank it's the bank for all the other banks and this is one reason I dislike the central bank so much because if you hate banks you should really hate 
the big daddy bank itself, especially because they have a money printer and they devalue everyone's savings by constantly printing more money and handing it out to people on Wall Street. So what happens? These new dollars, these new US dollars make their way from the Fed to Goldman Sachs. Now, supposedly they're locked up at Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs can't spend them because uh, they're locked up at the Fed, but somehow Goldman Sachs comes up with money to constantly buy all this, these new bonds at these treasury auctions. And so you can trace the journey of a baby new fresh dollar from the Federal Reserve go to Goldman Sachs. Maybe it's not the same dollar, maybe that dollar technically gets locked up in bank reserves, but somehow Goldman Sachs is coming up with money to buy these US treasuries. And you have to understand Goldman Sachs and the other primary dealers, these, these banks, they really are intermediaries simply because the Fed is not allowed to lend. It's in their charter that they're not allowed to lend. So there's this very tricky workaround, as you'd expect, from central bankers and from government officials, where it's like, no, oh, the Fed never lends. Well, uh, it doesn't do it directly, but it does it through the scummy Wall Street banks like Goldman Sachs. So this baby new dollar makes its way from the Federal Reserve to Goldman Sachs. And maybe it's not that actual dollar that goes into the U.S. Treasury because it's locked up in reserves. But maybe it's brother who otherwise would have been uh, staying there on the balance sheet. His, the, his brother uh, dollar goes to the U.S. Treasury and then gets spent by the U.S. government. So the U.S. dollar makes its way from the Fed through Goldman Sachs to the U.S. Treasury to Congress and gets spent. And then the bond, the Treasury bond, the government bond, makes its way the other direction. It goes from the U.S. Treasury to Goldman Sachs to the Fed. And so... Yes, the Fed is not technically lending, but they are basically monetizing the U.S. debt. It's 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 basically just a it's a technicality that they're they're um, exploiting. Now, why does the Fed need to buy government bonds? Simply because domestic buyers of bonds, you or, you or I don't want to buy treasuries that yield 0.5 percent. Uh, international buyers, depending on what the currency currency exchange rates are, in the last five years or so, they really have not been buying. Uh, bonds on margin. China and Russia have been buying gold instead of buying U.S. Treasury bonds on the margins. Obviously, they're still buying, but we're talking about marginal increases. So domestic buyers, we're talking real buyers, U.S. citizens, foreign buyers, foreign investors, these groups that have real money are not willing to pay as high of a price for the bonds as the Fed is willing to pay. Regular buyers like you and me, we would want a higher interest rate. Obviously, maybe you buy some, etc. But this is this is on the margins. And the reason we know this, you can say, how do I know that these uh, that domestic buyers and international buyers uh, are not willing to pay these prices? Well, simply because what happened in the repo crisis of the third quarter and fourth quarter of 2019, this is even before COVID, when the U.S. was running such high budget deficits, even before COVID, they were issuing so many treasuries that there was not enough room on the balance sheets of real entities like foreign buyers and domestic buyers. And the Fed had to step in and start buying treasuries to bring interest rates down. You had a spike, a big spike in repo rates, which is how treasuries are financed. And if this had been allowed to continue, it would have basically meant that you'd have a, uh, the mortgage on your house would be 13% and uh, your student loans would be 15% uh, or whatever. So basically the Fed had to step in and buy treasuries and do sort of a form of yield curve control. If the Fed were not buying, and we know this because the Fed was not buying right before the repo crisis, they were trying to shrink their balance sheet, but what happened is it got this big spike in interest rates, the Fed had to step in and buy. And so we know that if the Fed were not buying, the real interest rate, the actual interest rate, the non-interference interest rate on treasuries would be much higher, which would make it more expensive for the U.S. government to borrow money. So what the Fed is doing, it's definitely taking treasuries out of circulation and locking them up on its balance sheet. And if we take a look at that, we can see here's uh, all the treasuries held by the central bank, by the Fed, on its balance sheet. Back in 2019, they had about $2 trillion and now they have about 4.4 trillion. If we look at a larger chart, we can see that at some point the Fed tried to shrink their balance sheet in 2018 and it uh, caused a mini crash in the stock market. They're unable to ever shrink their balance sheet. And you can see that even this year when the, when the, the rate of change, when the slope is sort of leveled off as it did in August, July and August, we got a pullback 
in the stock market. So what's really going to happen here is this chart is going to have to go up for the rest of our lives. I wish there's a way to actually trade it. There is. You can be long gold and Bitcoin. But I wish there were an actual, uh, there were an actual derivative contract that would let you be long the Fed's balance sheet because it can never, uh, it can never go down again. So the Fed, by buying treasuries, locking it up on its balance sheet, the Fed is monetizing the U.S. debt, which just means it's printing new money, it's buying government debt to enable this deficit spending that the government is doing. Deficit spending is just when you spend more than you bring in in taxes. And this is one reason that we keep hearing these, um, these uh, uh, suggestions from the Fed and from Jerome Powell keep telling Congress that they need to pass a big stimulus package. He wants them to do that so that they'll have to issue more bonds and then he can buy the bonds because he's, his hands are sort of tied at this point. The federal funds rate, interest rates are basically at zero. And so traditional monetary policy stops working at this point and all he can do is monetize the debt. And this is why he needs Congress to cooperate. Now we would say that if the Fed were not buying lots of treasuries like it is, it would be impossible to have the sort of deficit spending that we have that C Congress is currently doing. As we said, taxes are not enough to cover the spending. So the problem with Van Meter and Brett Johnston is they're only looking at one side of the ledger. They're looking at this tiny, small technicality. They're ignoring the price of gold, the price of Bitcoin, the price of stocks, the increase in the M2 money supply. And they're focusing on some tech technicality that bank reserves are locked up at the Fed and can only sort of make their way into the economy through lending. But as we saw here, these newly printed dollars are making their way into the real economy through government spending. The, the dollar makes its way from the Fed to, to Goldman Sachs, to the US Treasury, and then it gets spent on real things that the government spends real things on. Without quantitative easing, without money printing, the US Treasury would have to pay a much higher interest rate, a much higher interest rate as we saw uh, at the repo crisis, or they would simply not have enough money to spend. And this would be deflationary if Congress could only live within its means like the rest of us have to do and could only spend as much money as it brought in in taxes. Now, to demonstrate this, I want to show you uh, what U.S. Treasuries have done this year. So the Fed holdings of U.S. Treasuries, when they came in this year, they held about $2.3 trillion, and it's now gone to $4.4 trillion. And I will... Um, Let's see. I will show you. I will. I'll, I'll link to this chart here. So we're about four point. Yeah, roughly four point four trillion. I'll link to this in the notes before, below. So they have bought. The Fed has bought two point one trillion worth of treasuries. These are just big round numbers, this year. The U.S. public debt, which is a, a measurement of how many treasuries are outstanding, uh, and there's a, there's some technicalities involved here with some intergovernmental holdings. But I think this is a good approximation. U.S. public debt has gone from 23.2 trillion to 26.8 trillion. Obviously, there's had been, there's had to a lot of debt has had to be issued to pay for these stimulus packages. So U.S. debt has gone up 3.6 trillion, and the Fed has bought 2.1 trillion. In other words, using these rough numbers, the Fed has bought about 60 percent, 58 percent of new government debt that has been issued this year. Now, in economics, in finance, in markets, we always talk about how important the marginal buyer is. If China starts to buy a tiny bit more oil, it can change oil prices around the world. But here we have something that's much more than the marginal buyer. Here we have a giant, ugly elephant in the room that is the main buyer of these treasuries. This is why we can't trust the yield curve anymore. We can't trust interest rates anymore because we have outright socialism outright manipulation of the market the fed is stepping in and buying all of this debt debt does van meter really think that if the fed wasn't buying 60 percent of u.s government debt that uh, things would be different the, the fact that they have to do this and this is a really extreme policy policy measure and uh, the fact that when they ever they try to shrink their balance sheet and let some of these treasuries roll off stocks immediately go down shows you that the Fed needs to do this and that it does inject liquidity into the market because when they buy bonds, the stock market goes up. When they stop buying bonds or try to shrink their balance sheet, the stock market goes down. So we have a situation where the federal government issues debt, the central bank is monetizing the debt with newly printed money. This is basically 
modern monetary theory. This is MMT. Uh, and it's done in a very fancy way here where we've got the primary dealers and we pretend that the U.S. Treasury is independent from the central bank. Uh, we, we love to talk about the independence of the central bank, but we don't really have that. We have this coordinated effort. This is basically a form, uh, a weak form of MMT in action. Now, the good news is you don't have to trust me or Van Meter when it comes to this. You can just look at charts of stocks, gold, and Bitcoin. I like to say that Bitcoin and gold are the thermometers in the room. You can have the government tell you or the central bank or Jerome Powell tell you that there's no inflation, there's no real money printing. Uh, they can tell you that it's not getting hot in the room, but you can look at the money supply. You can look at Bitcoin. You can look at gold. You can look at how stocks are behaving as, uh, as liquidity comes into the market from the Fed or is taken out of the market by the Fed. These will tell you what's really going on. And this is one reason that you never hear uh, Van Meter. I don't think he mentioned Bitcoin or gold uh, or even stocks in the uh, in the uh, in the video. In fact, he actually said that the the um, the banks are going to crash the stock market, which his his argument doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. That they're somehow trying to keep interest rates low and not lend, so they'll crash the stock market. It's a very bizarre conspiracy theory. But again, you don't have to trust me. You don't have to trust Van Meter. You can learn to decide for yourself about these things, and you can look at the price of gold. You can look at the price of Bitcoin, and these will tell you. Uh, these will give you a very good idea of whether there is liquidity being injected in the system or being sucked out of the system. This is the good news about Bitcoin and gold is they, uh, people on YouTube might try to mislead you or try to lie to you, but gold and Bitcoin will never lie to you. If you want to go a little bit deeper into this, I made a previous video that, that touched on some of these same issues about whether Fed money, money printing causes inflation and price inflation, CPI inflation versus asset price inflation. I will link to that in the description notes below as well. Hopefully you guys found this video helpful. If you did, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when my next video comes out. And let me know your questions, comments, responses, objections, critiques in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll see you in the next video.